Hello, and welcome to the Dali Museum for our 10th building anniversary. Today, we're sharing with you many of our Dalinian symbols um, that represent both the change and the continuity, um, that oxymoronic quality that is quintessentially Dali. And in that vein, we are going to be um, enjoying a talk by our curator of education, Peter Tush, on one such symbol, which is bread. We're also using this occasion to share with you some of the wishes from our wish tree over the last decade that intersect with our talks and with our themes. And so since one of the most enduring significances um, of bread is the concept of sustenance, I thought we might listen to some wishes from our wish tree that deal with this topic. Um, many times when people speak of sustenance, they're speaking of physical sustenance, as in the wishes, I wish for a new oven. I wish to marry food. I wish for bread, toys, and chicken nuggets. That's quite the list. I wish for the end of hunger. At other times, people are thinking of financial sustenance. How are we going to keep afloat? I wish that I could be a billionaire when I grow up. I wish for financial stability. Other times, people are looking for something more abstract, and they're looking for spiritual sustenance. I wish for a stronger will to endure the pain. I wish for unconditional love. I wish to live a life inspired, full of love and passion. And I wish that my imagination has no limits. So in the vein of both the enduring concept of bread as sustenance and the changeable metaphor that it represents for us, I'd like to invite Peter Tush to the stage to discuss Dali's bread. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, and welcome for our 10th anniversary talk. Um, I'm gonna be giving this talk followed by Kayla, my colleague who will be talking about this building that we're celebrating on our 10th anniversary. Um, the idea of enduring an endless fantasy and imagination seems to really gravitate or at least uh, congeal around this idea of Dolly's bread. Um, Dolly's bread is indeed for Dolly the symbol of both enduring metaphor, enduring symbol, and under constant change as his uh, life moves on. So there are many symbols in Dolly's uh, work. I've uh, given a talk this year about a variety of them, including melting watches and crutches, lips, um, just a variety of different things. But here we're talking about bread, and it is in many ways the symbol of Dalinian both changeability and continuity. And I'll be uh, outlining some of these ideas here. Um, there's a great quote by Dali in 1945. He said that bread is one of the oldest themes of fetishism and obsession in my work. The first, in fact, and the one to which I have been the most faithful. So he summarized it there and paid homage to bread as being somehow unique in his uh, symbolic language. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. It's also the only real Dalinian symbol that spans his entire career and has very distinct phases to it. So it goes from his earliest phase when he was in Madrid as a student, all the way through the 50s and 60s and even the building of his museum in the 1970s. In 1958, Dolly appeared with a 12 meter loaf of bread, a 40 meter long loaf of bread that was brought to this 1958 Paris fair, made quite the scene and took a host of different uh, chefs in order to prepare this unique object. And it was paraded through the, uh, the congealing of people. 10 years ago, when we opened this new museum and moved from our former location along the water in St. Petersburg, there was a procession from that museum to this museum. They actually prepared a 40 foot meter or 40 foot loaf of bread. Here you can see our volunteers bringing it from the old building to the new building. It was a momentous moment and something we were very excited about. And it seemed like the perfect symbol for that day. So here we are 10 years later. And once again, we have gone back to this perfect symbol, uh, a loaf of bread, 40 feet long, 12 meters, 
And this time it was carried by staff and volunteers around the building to mark this really special occasion on 1-11-21. So the 40-meter loaf of bread tribute, but why bread? What is it about bread for Dali? Let's uh, take a look at it. There is a great article that was written back in 2010 by Julia Pine, and Pine says in her article that for Dali, to make his bread, uh, the reason for this aspiration was to make his bread as recognizable as his mustache, encouraging his audience to consume and be nourished by Dalinian bread. And for Dali, bread begins as nutrition. The first time that it really appears in his paintings as a significant emblematic uh, um, focus point is the basket of bread from 1926. This was painted right when he was about to graduate from uh, the San Fernando Academy of Fine Art. And at this point, bread has a dual purpose. It's both nutrition physically and nutrition spiritually, um, because certainly it's being painted as a still life, but the history of still life through uh, Dutch and Flemish and Spanish Baroque paintings goes back to the much more spiritual aspect of, of consumption, the idea that, uh, that objects that we consume also have very strong religious and spiritual um, uh, dimensions to them. And in particular, this painting by Zoberon called Still Life with Lemons, Oranges, and Rose is one that seems very much related to what Dali was trying to accomplish in 1926. So he was trying to prove to himself, to his colleagues, to his professors, and the world that he had arrived as a great artist. He chose this particular painting of bread and this just incredible uh, cloth underneath it with all of these folds as the way to prove that he had arrived. He was so impressed and pleased with this accomplishment that he actually wound up sending it as one of the very first paintings abroad. This came to the United States and was shown at the Carnegie Institute in Pittsburgh in 1928, along with two other paintings he had, uh, had done at that point. It also gave him the conviction that he had become a great artist and allowed him the freedom to move away from this kind of realism that he was moving towards under the spell of Jan Vermeer in this early stage. So by the time we hit 1929 and the interest in the avant-garde and particularly surrealism, bread has become more Freudian. It has become specifically a symbol, and at this point it becomes uncanny and also highly sexualized. So 1928, the year before he meets the surrealists, he's moving in this direction. He's under the spell of surrealism, and in particular uh, Juan Miro. And at this point, a painting like this, which is called Big Thumb, beach, moon, and decaying bird, involves a number of abstract shapes which have multiple readings. So for example, this long object in the center that seems to hover and float, it is the big thumb being referred to in the title of the painting. It's also a bather, it's also a toe, it's also a phallus, and it is also a loaf of bread. And so the large round shape underneath it can be a secondary ver version of the moon that we see up above. It can also be a plate, and it can be a variety of things. So Dolly is very interested in openable change, and part of this means that this is now a still life, as much as it's a beach scene, a landscape. Two year, One years later, uh, 1929, Dolly has met the Surrealist. He's preparing for an exhibition in November that will mark his arrival, and he returns to bread in a very different form, here we have profanation of the host, and here the idea of bread as wafer or Eucharist or body of Christ, as in the central part of the Catholic Mass, is front and center. And at the very top of it, Dali is blossoming the church by spitting blood upon the body of Christ or the bread of, the, um, of this particular uh, service over the chalice. So it's a highly shocking image. It's an alignment of Dolly with the group um, under the idea of blasphemy against the church. And it's very much a symbolic recognition of bread. But it's a very shocking one that will give way to a very different reading uh, very shortly. So by 1932, this becomes what could be referred to as the year of bread in Dolly's paintings. I think there are at least six to seven paintings from this year that, uh, that situate bread very centrally. Dolly said um, after a two-month period that he had been in Port Legat in 1932, he returns to Paris. And he says that upon arriving in Paris, I said to everyone who would care to listen, 
bread, bread, and more bread, nothing but bread. This they regarded as the new enigma, which I was bringing to them from Port Lagat. Has he become a communist? They would say jokingly. For they had guessed that my bread, the bread I had invented, was not precisely intended for the succour or sustenance of large families. My bread was as ferociously anti-humanitarian bread. It was the bread of the revenge of the imaginative luxury on the utilitarianism of the rational, practical world. And this is exactly what he's talking about, this very strange presentation of these three loaves of bread in this particular painting called The Invisible Man. They are somewhat of a still life presentation, but definitely there's something else altogether. Dolly references H.G. Wells' book, the science fiction novel, The Invisible Man. And indeed, there's a chair there that seems to be covered with a, a sheet and has an impression of a person who's no longer there. And in that person's place, there is this object, this very um, phallic, erect loaf of bread that has sort of substituted for the person that's missing. There's also a secondary loaf of bread that balances right above the, at the top of the chair, almost like it's balancing on the head of the figure. And then there's a third loaf of bread, which is placed right on the edge of the table, and it has been chopped. So it's horizontal bread, and it has been cut many times leading to the, the Freudian fear of, um, of uh, castration. And indeed, when we look at it up close, you know, it definitely has that sexual phallic reference, um, which then leads us into the whole series of paintings from this particular year. So Dolly goes on to say that I had eaten my fill. So he's talking about being at a particular table with bread um, as part of what he was eating. I'd eaten my fill and I was looking absentmindedly, though fixedly, at a piece of bread. It was the heel of a long loaf lying on its belly, and I could not cease looking at it. Finally, I took it and kissed the very tip of it. Then with my tongue, I sucked it a little to soften it, after which I struck the softened part on the table where it remained standing. I had just reinvented Columbus's egg, the bread of Salvador Dali. I had just discovered the enigma of bread. It could stand up without having to be eaten. And the reference here to Columbus's egg, there is a apocryphal story that Columbus challenged a group of people who were questioning his endeavor, his journey, and he challenged them to try to take an egg and stand it on its end. Supposedly, nobody was able to, and what Columbus showed is that by taking the egg, standing it upright, and then pushing it just a little to basically break the tip of the egg, it would stand perfectly. And that's what Dolly's referring to in this idea of the, uh, the standing Columbus egg of the loaf of bread. And here in this next painting, also from 1932, Woman with Cattle and Bread, here the cattle, the cattle and bread has become very anthropomorphic. It is both phallic and it is fondling the naked woman in front of the table. So it has taken one more step beyond just sitting, standing in the chair. Now it is standing and interacting with the nude next to it. Very peculiar, to say the least. And Dolly goes on to say, in the apparently insignificant gesture of putting on the end of the loaf of bread upright on the table, the whole spiritual experience of this period was summarized. A very curious statement, to say the least. We see in this next bread, which was once owned by Madonna, the anthropomorphic bread, that same loaf is now without the person, but certainly it can be described as phallic, and it's standing upright as it's placed against this, uh, this beautiful wall and a sheath, so it's become a French loaf of bread, a baguette. And in the very next painting from our collection, the Catalan bread, here it has become all the more obvious, the phallic nature of it, and indeed the reference is not only to being erect, but also the fear of impotence because now the bread is erect, but only because it has been lassoed, and the melting watch that goes across it seems to reveal the fear that's embodied within this bread, this really overly exaggerated black comedy version of his bread. And there's the inkwell with the pen in it, and Dolly talks about the smearing of the ink which soils the bread. So all of these references to bodily functions, which are both uh, um, arousing and... Um, embarrassing, all seem to be part of the way Dolly has approached it. And then there's this astounding painting from 1932 called The Average French Bread with Two Eggs on a Plate Without a Plate on Horseback, Attempting to Sodomize a Crumb of Portuguese Bread. 
And here you can see that the bread has now also got the two egg yolks, so it's got testicles as well. And it seems to be going after something far more large and in, indomitable, which is this Portuguese bread. So it's weirdly ritualistic, and at the same time, it's highly comic, and it's presented in such a way that makes it feel like a, um, a piece by Vermeer, this sort of unusual, extravagant, and extraordinary lighting that these two objects seem to um, be caught within. It's sort of like a, a, a mystical situation that we're observing from a distance. And there's a few more. There's the surrealist objects, which are indicators of instantaneous memory, where in this particular painting that gathers together a number of different and disparate objects, right in the center of it, there's a loaf of bread, which also becomes a spoon that has the fried eggs in it and the inkwell. So it's an all-accommodating loaf of bread. And one more reference to 1932. This is a backlit small theater box. It's a diorama. It's called Babau. It was to go along with a movie script that Dolly had written in hopes of maybe getting the movie produced, but it has seven plates of glass on which Dolly has painted a series of scenes that then can be overlaid and mixed by pulling out the different plates. And it's backlit, but you can see all these gentlemen on bicycles are wearing loaves of bread on their head. So in 1932, we have bread hats, which seems to be a reference to um, absurdity and foolishness. And it's almost going back to the the chair with the loaf of bread balancing on it. Now the man, the gentleman, has come to be wearing the loaf of bread. So now we move just a little bit further in this surrealist period to the idea of dislocation, the idea that the object represented by bread has somehow become dislocated from its normal um, environment. So, for example, when Dolly was writing an article on involuntary sculpture, focusing on very strange little bits of debris and objects that could be found, he had Brassai do a photograph of this ornamental loaf of bread from above, seen in a very strange way that makes it somehow not a loaf of bread, but something much more extraordinary. He also um, goes on to say in The Secret Life, his autobiography, this thing so atavistically and consubstantially welded to the idea of primary utility, the elementary basis of continuity, the symbol of nutrition, of sacred sustenance, this thing I was going to render useless and aesthetic. So a huge part of Dolly's goal is to take something that has so many meanings associated with it and to turn it into something completely meaningless, something that no longer functions as it has done up until this point. And so here we have the retrospective bust of a woman where the loaf of bread has once again come to the top of the head and balances precariously, almost like a plinth, upon which Dolly has placed the... Uh, Angelus couple as an inkwell that also are part of this strange and very uncanny and kind of enigmatic um, presentation. He goes on to say that, um, well, it, the context is that Dolly's at a Paris bistro now and a waiter delivers a basket of bread to the table. Everyone present at the table supposedly said in astonishment, it's like a Dali. So the bread of Paris was no longer the bread of Paris. Dolly declares that it was my bread. Dolly's bread, Salvador's bread. The bakers were already beginning to imitate me. So the bread presentation and the way it looked, Dolly was recognizing, or at least Dolly's friends were recognizing, that he had already influenced the culture of, uh, of Paris by this point. In 1936, a few years later, one of the great uh, surrealist paintings Dolly created, Morphological Echo, the bread is very much in the center of this uh, this combination, and this is a, a sort of example of how Dolly creates hallucinations, how one object resembles another and can be made in a very strange way to echo other types of forms. So we have objects that can be consumed on the table, so a still life. We have three people resembling those objects in the middle, so portraits. And then in the very background, we have landscape with three walls or mineral shapes in the landscape. But right in the very center at the bottom, that's a loaf of bread sitting on its heel, one slice cut, which resembles both Dolly's nanny, the woman in the center, or that large rock in the very top. And then moving forward just a little bit more, 1940, the last of these 1930s, 19 um, surrealist paintings from the 1930s. This is two pieces of bread expressing the sentiment of love, a very sweet title for a very strange painting. You can see there's actually several pieces of bread there and some crumbs. 
in the middle of this very open landscape, almost like a desert landscape or a very large beach. There's two people in the distance. And there's also a chess piece, a pawn that's sitting between them. And this has to do with the time that Dali and Gala, his wife, spent with Marcel Duchamp playing chess in Arcachon prior to leaving when the Nazis started to move south in France. Um, the chess game was a very big part of their engagement with uh, Duchamp and somehow works into the sentiment of love. So we move from, uh, from this period of time, from surrealism. It seems like Dolly in 1940 stops talking about the bread for a period. But then in 1945, Bray comes again, and it's a magnificent painting. It's called Basket of Bread, Rather Death Than Shame. And this was a piece that Dolly kept in his own collection. He prized this above most of his other paintings. He was very, very pleased with it. He said that, I painted this work for two, consecu two consecutive months, four hours a day. During this period, the most surprising and sensational episodes occurred in contemporary history. This work was finished in one day before the end of World War II. So this is from the big, big new gallery where it was first shown. And you can see how this placement of the loaf of bread on the right-hand side, very much referencing Vermeer and referencing um, the kind of still life paintings from the Baroque that Dolly cherished, uh, it's right on the very edge of the table against this incredible dark background. So the chiaroscuro is used to create great drama. It seems to have this unearthly glow to it. And it's precarious the way it's placed, which I think is a reference back to that 1932 loaf, which is chopped on the table also towards the edge. It's like a mirror image of it. And it's clearly a reference back to the 1926 uh, loaf of bread that started his use of bread in his paintings. It should also be pointed out that this end of the loaf of bread also has this really extraordinary sort of quality to the texture. So it seems almost like a shoulder of a person. It almost seems like there's um, a suturing that has happened along the sides of it. So there's a kind of scarification. So it's a really extraordinary and very strange um, presentation. But at this point, it becomes very spiritual. It becomes very much Eucharistic. Dolly says that 19 years ago, I painted the same subject. If you make a detailed comparison between the two works, and he's talking about these two, you can study the whole history of painting from the lineal charm of primitivism through the stereoscopic hyper aestheticism. This typically realistic work is the one that has satisfied, most satisfied my imagination. Here we have a painting about which nothing can be said, the total enigma. Not exactly sure that's true. It seems like there's a whole lot that I'm able to say at this point. I'm not sure any of it really scratches the surface, though. And for Dolly, there is a sense that it's an emptying out. It's a symbol that's not referring to radical, large concepts, but just a complete experience. And here's the scale of it, just for comparison. And then by 1955 years later, suddenly Dolly is very clearly thinking about the religious Eucharistic aspects of bread. And so in this first painting, Madonna of Port Legat, we have a painting of his wife Gala as the Madonna with the Christ child on her lap in this, what's referred to as a kind of post-atomic nuclear mystical painting where objects all float as if they're atomic particles, but they're held in perfect suspension with one another. And when we see the detail, you can see it's that same loaf of bread that we saw in 1945 at this point floating within the Christ child as if it's an open tabernacle. Two years later, Dolly paints Nuclear Cross, where bread has now become almost like that wafer from the Catholic Mass, but it also has a kind of moonlight texture or consistency where all those uh, openings, all those little porous um, uh, openings on the loaf of bread look almost like uh, craters on the moon. And again, we have this kind of nuclear uh, creation of these particular, the cross starting to divide down into smaller particles. We also have the Eucharistic still life from that same year where we have two loaves of bread and three fish, which is uh, refers back to the allegory of the feeding of the multitude that uh, that's in the Bible, where we have, um, again, a ritual presentation reminding us again of Francisco de Zerberon. And finally, the, uh, the last use of bread in Dolly's paintings is in 1955 in The Last Supper, where Dolly has a very different type of interpretation of the Last Supper than Leonardo da Vinci's. It's very much about symmetry. It's about numerology. And it's also about anonymity. 
that the only figure we look at is Christ. And when you go very close, you can see the loaf of bread has been broken, and it's on either side of him symmetrically, uh, representing the body of Christ and then the wine as the blood of Christ. And then just to conclude this talk, so moving from bread in the paintings to bread as a kind of performative experience, which almost picks up where the paintings leave off, we go back just a few years to begin with this kind of idea of comedy related to bread. And Dolly does this incredible series of photographs with Philippe Halsman. And actually, for 20 years, they get together every year and do some extraordinary photographs. In 1949, Dolly produces the popcorn nude with Philippe Halsman. And this has to do with this um, obsession, this new obsession that Dolly has arrived at with nuclear particles. He calls himself a nuclear mystical painter, and he starts to see the world um, through the filter of this metaphor that everything in the world that's solid is actually made up of particles that are in motion. And here Dolly has taken a traditional nude from painting. He's animated her. She's flying in the air. And the bread has become a series of particles that are exploding around her, which Dolly seems to be initiating in this one kick that he has. And then very shortly after that, just a few years later in 1957, Dolly has an opportunity to do a series of illustrations for Don Quixote. He takes two rhino horns and he stuffs loaves of bread inside of them, dips them in ink wells, and uses that ink on the printing stones, basically producing what becomes the windmills in this particular image, the attack on the windmills from uh, Don Quixote. And Dolly goes on to say that um, a group of society women implored me to reveal to them the secret of the bread. I then confirmed to them that the principal act of bread, the first thing that has to be done, was to bake a loaf of 15 meters in length. Nothing was more feasible um, on condition that one go about it seriously. So Dolly, this is going back to the early 1950s, and Dolly is saying that the most Dalinian loaf of bread is one that's impossible to either consume or even to deal with as a loaf of bread. And indeed, that brings us to 1958, when Dolly bakes the 40-foot loaf of bread. It's not a loaf to be consumed. It's a loaf to become an impossible object to intrude into our rational world. And he goes on to say, if such an act could be successfully carried out through the rigorous attention to all the relevant de detail that I have planned, it would be capable of creating a state of confusion, of panic and collective hysteria. <clears throat> and he goes on to say, such large loaves should be baked in secrecy and brought out in strange places and placed around the city of Paris randomly without anybody knowing who's placing them or what the intent of these large loaves of bread is. So it's all about causing panic, causing hysteria, leading to states of confusion, that somehow bread has moved from being symbolic to being an actual um, device or a tool of activation. And here's another one of those photographs of the 1958 loaf of bread. Also in 1958, Dolly winds up wearing a loaf of bread, very much like he had drawn the gentleman riding bicycles with the loaves of bread on their head. And in 1961, there is a particular um, uh, bullfight in, uh, in Barcelona to honor Dolly. And in order to be greeted at this, he gets another loaf of bread. He wears it very comfortably on top of his head. So very much it became identified with Dolly at this point. And the final thing to share with you is that the bread's final incarnation is in terms of architecture. And Dolly had written in the 1930s about edible architecture, in particular Antoni Gaudi's uh, architecture in Barcelona, as looking very much like something you could consume, something so much like cheese or something nourishing that it didn't seem substantial to live in, but rather something to be consumed. And that's Dali's goal with his own museum. So in 1974, the Teatro Museo Dali opens, and this is the uh, Torre Galatea around the corner, which has the large eggs on top. And all of these pockmarked uh, details here are large loaves of bread, cattle and bread that Dali has decorated this building with. So Come to the Dolly Museum, consume the bread, consume Dolly, be part of the nutrition of the irrational, I suppose, that Dolly represents. And with that, I conclude. Um, thank you for joining me for this celebration of Dolly's 10th anniversary. I suggest you consume Dolly, eat more bread. Thank you very much. Thank you.